Amen. Amen. We celebrate Jesus tonight. Um, we truly celebrate Jesus tonight for what he is doing. And today you've come. Uh, good to see you all. Yesterday, for those who've come today and probably yesterday you heard other things, I was telling the congregation gathered yesterday, of course those who are online as well, uh, and I'll repeat that here uh, tonight, um, just as we, for me as I climax and then for other colleagues as they take on, that uh, my heart gets warmed as a minister when I see people like you commit yourselves and come to connect with the Lord in this place. My heart gets so encouraged and, and, and sometimes humanly, I know it's not possible, but humanly I wish, uh, even when I pray with people, I wish I could dispense in instant answers to your prayers. I wish I could just turn on a tap and boo 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 answered, you go. Boo, 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 boo. Your child is healed, you go. Boo, 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 boo. You got a job, you go. Boo, 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 boo. You got a husband, you go. Boo, 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 you. I mean, when I look at you, my heart is so encouraged that our people have set themselves out to prioritize God when, when people are choosing the things of the world. When men are going into pubs tonight, this evening, my fellow men, you've chosen to be in the house of God. Ladies, when women are meeting for uh, merry-go-rounds and charmers, you've chosen to come into the house of God. And I pray that the King of Kings, in whose name we gather here, will not let you go empty-handed. I pray that the Lord will not let you this week be different. That this week will be a different week. Different from other weeks. That the simple fact of you stepping here by faith the Lord will answer your prayers and he'll, re he'll release you as a testimony of what him only can do. Amen? So I was telling the congregation yesterday as I was preaching at the beginning that please remain in this place. It may tarry, but in the long run, the Lord will confirm his miracle and answers to your prayers very, very soon in this life. Amen? Amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you that yet again you call us to your presence to submit before you and to bow at your feet. Thank you so much for the beautiful things you've ordained for us tonight. And thank you for your word that is sharper than a double-edged sword. Your word that indeed is the bread of life and the spring of living waters. Tonight, may you feed each one of us and may you deal with the hunger that is brought about by the enemy and may Christ Jesus, may you be sufficient in our lives. We surrender to you tonight. And pray that you speak to our hearts. And confirm the miracle of your word in our lives. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, let's greet each other in the air. If you're at home on Zoom, on, on YouTube, just let's greet each other up in the air. We praise Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who saves, the one who set us apart. Our topic for tonight is the anointing of the king. The anointing of the king. This week we've been running the series of Jesus as king. And remember, we're saying, behold, you are king. And so Jesus is king. And he desires to be exalted. And he desires to dominate and to reign in my life. As he reigns in your life as well. And so really that is the focus and as we shared yesterday, that if there is anything we have enthroned in our lives as competitive kings alongside Jesus, that we dethrone them this week. We bring them down to the feet of the Lord, that Jesus may be enthroned and that he may reign and rule over us. Amen? And as we get to Easter, on Easter Sunday, gathered here celebrating the resurrection as his grace leads us, that truly Jesus will be resurrected and he will raise us to reign with him because he is king. Amen? In John chapter 12, I read to us by Reverend Mrs. Sarah, we see the story of Mary, the sister to Lazarus and Martha, anoint Jesus. 
And again, as I did on Sunday, but today I'll not do as much, uh, the three passages report Mary anointing Jesus. That is Matthew chapter 26. If you have your notebook and writing, taking notes, or if you have your uh, iPad, Matthew chapter 26, verse 6 to verse 13. We also have that parallel passage in Mark chapter 14, verse 1 to 9. Mark 14, 1 to 9. Then, of course, our text, John chapter 12. And so these three passages tell the story of Mary anointing Jesus. And that is where we get our theme for today, our topic for today, the anointing of the king. I must explain that both Matthew and Luke say that they anoint, Mary anointed his head. So they talk of the head. But when you come to John, um, when you come to John, he talks of anointing of what? Did you listen to that? Anointing of? His feet. Anointing of? Down there. And so many times when we do Bible study, uh, there are tools we use to determine what was going on here. Um, why would Matthew and Mark talk of the head? And why would John talk of the feet? Uh, today, we are not in a critical theological study, but we are here to extract spiritual truth. So I'll save you that and encourage you to go to TE class or go to basic uh, theological school courses to understand that a lot better. So I'll save you that. But I want to pull off a spiritual truth here that when we read the three in harmony, there are moments when you read passages of scripture in harmony alongside each other without saying this is right or this is wrong. When we read Matthew 26, Mark 14, and John 12 in harmony, then we can conclude with a spiritual revelation that Jesus was anointed both on his head and also on his feet. And we are settled with that. We are safer there. And so, and that is the position that I want to take tonight. That he is anointed in the head and in the feet as well. But what is going on here? Let me build up this. Then we get to the place of anointing. And then we explain certain things, some deeper revelations around what Mary does as she anoints the feet of Jesus. And that will lead us to the place of prayer. And so, what is happening here in John chapter 12 is that Jesus is in Bethany. I said on Sunday that Bethany is only three kilometers uh, to Jerusalem, two miles only to Jerusalem. And so, he comes back and retreats in Bethany, but he is aware that in Jerusalem are people who are scheming to arrest him not just arrest him, but also to kill him. Let me show you that. In John chapter 11. John chapter 11. Just look at John chapter 11 verse 53. John 11 verse 53. To see what's awaiting Jesus. Just in a couple of days. The Bible says uh, under six days. So, from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. So, they are planning on how to kill Jesus. So, that is the secret there. In verse 57, they also say, now the chief priests, the Pharisees, and the elders um, had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, that is Jesus, he should let them know so that they might come and arrest him. So Jesus knows that he's being sought after and there is a scheme to arrest him, to persecute him, to kill him, and to bury him. But it's so interesting that he goes just close by, three kilometers. I don't know where three kilometers from Nakasero would be. My geography is not very good here. Where would three kilometers from Nakasero be? To, my, to this way. Where would that be? Hamocha. I'm hearing Hamocha to this way. Eh? Mango. Eh, the pronunciations are very difficult, huh? And to my left, this way, three kilometers. Eh? Nakawa. 
Hey, this guy seems to know everything. Did you teach geography in school? <laughs> so, Jesus is only three kilometers away, but they are going to kill him in Jerusalem. But what interests me here is that one, he is not in a panic mode. Because ordinarily he would not have gone and, and stayed in Bethany. He would have ran away. He does not. But again, what interests me here is the Bible says that he goes to the house of Lazarus, Martha, and Mary to stay there. He does not go into hiding. He would have found his way, got a car, and found his way at night to Entebbe and flew out to Egypt or, um, or to the Middle East and sneaked out far away. And so Jesus is around. He's not bothered by the schemes of, this thing, of these people. He does not lobby the most powerful person in government to intervene on his behalf. Actually, he would have done that. He would have said, please, can you spare my life? I'm only young. I'm just over 30. Can, can somebody rescue me? They would have even sent an SOS to the president or to the governor, to the emperor, as we said yesterday. Jesus does not lobby. He does not scheme. He does not pour resources. In Uganda, if such a thing was to happen to somebody, you will pour money. You will pour money to lawyers and lawyers will be seated and scheming and crafting how they'll make, put in submissions and orders to restrain uh, uh, the Pharisees and the Romans from arresting him. He does not do any of that. He does not even uh, seek sympathy from them. And this really touches me. That as he nears death, he is around his place of death and is so peaceful. He is in the house of Lazarus and his sisters and he is enjoying dinner. And we will talk about that in a little while. That, that simply means that even in the moment of crisis, our Lord Jesus Christ learned to trust in the Lord even difficult, when difficulty was around the corner. He did not overreact and he did not give up. He did not show desperation. But he trusted the Lord that you who called me will allow your will to prevail over this matter. And that is why he prays in Gethsemane. My will, not your will. Let this cup pass me if it is your will. And so, beloved, I want to ask us, as we walk with the Lord in this journey of faith, when crisis beckons around you, what is your reaction? When crisis knocks on your door, there is a terrible sickness or um, there is death that has happened or your job is on the line. When crisis comes around you, when you and your wife are on the verge of divorcing, terrible disagreements in the family, when unhelpful things and unwanted things happen in your midst, what is your first reaction? Do you get into depression? Do you consider suicide? What, what do you do? And many of us have thought of ending their lives when things turn blue, when things turn red. We've considered suicide many times. Many times we've considered giving up our faith and going to a witch doctor somewhere to fix us, to confuse them somewhere. But I love Jesus that he puts his trust in God the Father. And he's so confident in the Father that the Father who has sent him to save humanity will fix this situation. And so beloved, as you sit here tonight and as you're watching us tonight, I'd love to encourage you to learn to have your faith settled in the Lord Jesus Christ. When things become so difficult, when you're unable, could you just sit back on that chair and grab your Bible and read a passage? Or just utter a prayer? Can you go to that corner in your house, just kneel and utter a prayer and say, into your hands, Lord, I commit this. May your will be done and not my will. When we do that, then the Lord takes over. Amen? When you step back and allow him to be the king and to be in charge, Jesus has a tendency to usually take over when you surrender to him. Women who are here, when you begin to panic and demonstrate that the world has completely come to an end and you're wailing and you're shouting and you're cursing and, and doing all sorts of things, then the Lord looks from the side and wonders, so what does she think? Can't she see me that I can sort that situation? 
I want to encourage you that in your workplace, in your business, when that tender slips away off your hand and you do not sign it, learn to sit back and thank the Lord that you did not sign that tender because your tender is coming. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Learning to trust in Jesus and have our faith settled in him. And so, Jesus is not in a panic mode. But what does he do? The Bible says that he goes, in verse 2, he goes for dinner. And he finds Martha who served her. If you read other passages, they add a little more flour to this. But they find Martha who serves her. And Lazarus is reclining with him. There is no word from Lazarus. The only action reported is that he's reclining with the Lord. He's keeping him company. Whereas Martha is busy in cooking and entertaining him. But Mary goes, sits at the feet of the Lord and does an incredible thing. Just before we pull off from there. Do you know, when I was reading this, when I was preparing, it reminded me that even when things are blue, when you're through the thicket, that your survival is determined by the company that you keep, the friends who are around you. And so, no wonder Jesus is so settled and is not worried because he has confidence that there are three people whose back he has. And he's able to walk to Bethany and he's able not to panic about what awaits him in Jerusalem. As we gather here, I don't know whether you can look at your friends and count them to be people whose back you can have when you're going through difficulty. Who you can say, I am not worried in this matter because I know Evans is with me. And my brother or my sister, uh, so-and-so is with me, is walking through with me in this. And so what type of friends do you have? These people choose to be around the Lord in his most difficult time of need. You will know your friends when your most difficult time of need comes. And you will see them around you. Many times people who are fake, who are not genuine friends, will always fall off. And that is why we encourage you as believers that you choose your friends so carefully that you are led by the Lord to what I call divine friends. Always ask the Lord, lead me to divine friends. People who will support me and walk with me in my journey of faith. And if you're here and you have friendships that are the reason why you keep sinning, you keep backsliding, you keep compromising your faith, tonight is your night to make a decision to drop them off. You must be bold enough to make those decisions and to say, I am ending this relationship because it's not taking me anywhere. I've met ladies who have male friends who invite them home and begin to make advances on them and lead them towards compromising their faith. And so friends, those birthday invites, where you are just the two of you at home, be careful about those birthday invites. Be careful about them. Even for your children, their sleepovers where your children are invited for. Be careful. Who do your children hang around? And who do you hang around? Who are your friends? If you have friends who are leading you to compromise your faith, if you have friends who are encouraging you to disregard what scripture teaches to throw away the weight of faith that you have so much sustained, this Holy Week invites you to throw them away. To make those very hard decisions and ask the Lord for divine friends. I don't know whether you're here and you say, man, Provost, you're really speaking to me because my friends are the reason I am stuck where I am stuck. And you're saying tonight, man, Provo, as you call for prayer, I'm coming for prayer for boldness and courage to make a decision on the type of friends that I love, that the Lord will lead me to divine friends. Today we are having the session with the clergy. And one of the things we were discussing, led by the Lord, is that my, uh, Rev, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33 says, bad company corrupts good morals. And one of the conversations we are having is that as clergy, even as clergy, we need to ask the Lord to lead us to good friends. Friends who will be praying with us, 
friends who will have our best interest at heart, friends who will start us up on. So tonight here at Nakasero, I pray that that will be you, that you will claim divine friends from here tonight. They could be just one, they could only be two, but they will be people, brothers and sisters who journey with you in the journey of faith, people who will stir you up, people will cause you to be growing every single now and again. And that tonight is my submission to you. One of the things a believer should do is to have a sense of boldness and the capacity to make decisions and not to be sheepish and to say, oh, you know, it will look bad. You know, they'll think that I am, I am being too proud. I am acting too saved. You know, just for the sake of me, them not look, um, me not appearing too bad, I'll just keep them, but I'll just know the boundaries. Let me tell you, there are moments you will not draw those boundaries. There are moments those boundaries will be erased even before you knew. I once prayed with a lady who had come to my office when I was assistant provost. I do not know what she told me. She's a very staunch Christian, very staunch. But she entertained this man who would come. I know that that day the man refused to leave the house. The man refused to leave. And he refused and he started touching, touching. Just touching, touching. And you know touching, touching, this body is not wood. It is not stone, no. When you touch this body, all things will begin to happen. And the guy slept there until morning. And things happened. So she came broken in my office. Saying, Reverend, I feel so dirty. I feel so filthy. Please, can you pray for me in repentance? So, friends and colleagues, sometimes those boundaries will be erased without even you knowing. You'll find yourself playing along. You know, we say in psychology that one thing leads to another and it leads to another and it leads to another and before you know you are beyond the point of no return. There is a point of no return in psychology called the point of no return. Now you can't go back. You're already there. It has to happen. Tonight I pray that God will give you discernment. And you'll make a bold decision to say no to a friend. If I was to ask you at altar call time to write the names of friends you want to drop tonight, God to give you boldness, you'll bring papers here and you'll say, this one is going and this one is going and I'll tell them or I'll avoid them. But let me progress with this story. When you read these three accounts, as I said, you realize that the anointing is on the head but also on the feet. That's demonstrates a profound devotion on the part of Mary um, to Jesus Christ. There are many details to this story, but Martha is busy cooking, but Mary chooses to anoint the Lord. This anointing by Mary of our king demonstrates that Jesus, I mean that Mary did not want to wait until the Lord dies then she releases the most expensive oil that she had. You're told that this was worth a whole year's salary. And assuming, and really assuming, that a month's salary, probably for an average Ugandan, I don't know, I don't know what a month's salary would look like. Probably, probably six million. I don't know whether that's too high or too low. 10 million Ugandan shillings? Is that too high or too low? Where do you guys live? I thought you are the rich people of Uganda. <laughs> how, many, how many millions? Would, would be an average salary. 500,000 for a month. Oy, you should all come live in Kenya then. <laughs> hey, you should all come live in Kenya. In Kenya, the average salary for somebody would be about 6 million um, is it 6 million, 60 mi 6 million it would be about what? about 6 million Ugandan shillings which is about 250,000 Kenyan shillings that would be an average salary for, a, for an average Kenyan I'm enticing you to come and look for work there so for, for in Kenyan terms, it would be like 72 million Ugandan shillings in a year or up to 100, 100 million uh, Ugandan shillings in a year. 
So that is the equivalent, general equivalent. I'm not talking of those under the base so much, just at the average, slightly above average. That was the equivalent. That was the worth of oil that she used to anoint the feet of Jesus. You know, when you look at that, you realize that was expensive oil. But I want us to see something here. Mary did not want to wait until it is too late to give her best to the Lord. She wanted to do it immediately because she knew the Lord was on her way. Definitely to death. Sometimes, beloved, do you know we wait until it is too late to celebrate people? We wait until somebody dies, then we give lots of money in their funeral. But you don't appreciate them when they're still alive. Mary realized she has to deal with the Lord when she's alive. And I want to remind each one of us here, even away from those money things, that there are moments in life that you need to give your best to the Lord when there is still time. The Bible says in John chapter 4, uh, chapter 9 verse 4, that we must do the work of him who called us when it is still day. For night is coming when no one can work. And many of us postpone salvation and put punctuation marks around salvation until it is the right time. Mary's story tells us that you must accept the Lord Jesus Christ at the right time. Especially you young folk. You young folk who delay and wait for salvation when you are already spent up. You've already used your energy and your, your resourcefulness in the kingdom of darkness. And then probably uh, with due respect to everyone who is old, uh, you're 70 or 75. Is now when you're coming, you want to volunteer in church. You don't even have the energy to come for meetings. You don't even have the energy to do the things that younger people are doing here. I want to encourage you, volunteer for the Lord when you're young. Volunteer for God's work when you still have the energy and the oomph to do God's work. You know, I am appointed the provost at 45. I mean, if I was 70, would I be able to wake up every 7 o'clock for meetings? Would I come to Uganda and do these marathons? I would preach once and I'm so tired, I want to sleep. And so I want to encourage you, if it is about volunteering, volunteer for God's work now. Some of you, I see you here and I look at your faces. You've refused to serve on committees because you feel that there are others who are doing it. Oh, I'll do it when I retire. We need you now. We don't need you when you retire. We need you now. Volunteer and give your very best when you're here. When you're doing your professional work as HR, your professional work as communications, your professional work in property management, your professional work as a finance person, bring that here when you're still fresh and you're able even to see the figures that we are talking about. Not when you're used up and you're tired and you are unable even to drive yourself. You're driven. And so I encourage you and I charge you. As the seniors serve among us and we respect the seniors, I want to ask all these middle-aged and younger people to give themselves for serving the Lord. Because Mary recognizes that time is going and she cannot wait. Because time is coming, night is coming when nobody will be able to work. And so let us serve the Lord when it is still day. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I want to give three, three, um, three significances of anointing and then we pray. So significance number one from the anointing of, our, of the feet of Jesus and his head, we see a deeper significance of worship that Mary is demonstrating a total and selfless act of worship as she sits at the foot of Jesus and anoints her, uh, his head and feet with oil. So this is an act of public worship that this lady is not embarrassed that she chooses to identify with Jesus even at a time when ordinarily as a woman she should not be near a Jesus according to the Jewish laws. And so she, she releases herself and gives her very best. Uh, Judas is trying to push back and saying you're wasting money but she gives her best at the foot of the Lord when she knows that everything else it is at stake. So she's not embarrassed. She's not fearful, but she boldly rises up and worships the Lord, goes to her feet. I want to ask you here tonight, that as we walk with the Lord, you are a believer, but as you walk with the Lord, are you bold enough to undertake certain acts because of your selfless love for Jesus Christ? 
without looking at who is seeing you, without feeling embarrassed or being profiled? Are you willing to go that extra mile for the sake of Jesus because it's an act of worship? I know men fear to carry their Bibles like this, so they'll hide the Bible always when they come to church. I know men fear to kneel at home and pray because children will see them and they'll be embarrassed. I know sometimes as women, there are things we fear to do because people will feel we are hyper-spiritual. We are giving ourselves too much. You're going to church too much. But Mary gives her very best in terms of worshiping the Lord. And she chooses to ignore any embarrassment that her acts for the Lord may attract. And so are you bold enough tonight? Are you bold enough tonight to let your friends to let your family, your workmates, your neighbors, your business partners, your colleagues know that you are a believer. Are you bold enough to do your devotion in the office when everyone else is around? Are you bold enough to kneel in the office as you finish your devotion and pray to the Lord and demonstrate that act of worship, not as a show, but as submission to the Lord Jesus Christ? Or we feel so sheepish, we want to be careful. In Kiswahili, we say, you want to be a mungwana. You want to be a honorable person who carries themselves in decorum. Let me tell you, beloved, when the devil confronts you, he does not care how honorable you are. He handles you with, without mercy and he messes your life completely and rips everything apart. And therefore, we must learn to go to the Lord in confidence because submission to him in that confidence then scares away the enemy. Praise the Lord. So are you willing to demonstrate acts of worship before the Lord without any fear, without any embarrassment. So tonight, there is something that you've been fearing even to bring before the Lord. And you've been feeling that this one I need to hold back a little. This is too much. I don't want to go to the front. Oh, this one will be sorted out. Oh, I'll wait for another revival. Oh, come on. Do you want to be a Mary tonight? Do you want to carry it to the feet of Jesus? And say, Lord, I bring this to your feet now. As an act of worship, I surrender this now. May you deal with it because you are king. Amen? Those who will do that tonight, the Lord will honor you. And I'll tell you what, she te what Jesus tells Mary out of that act of worship. Number two significance of this anointing is that it's, a, it's sacrificial because she does not just give, but she gives her best. As I said, 100 million Ugandan shillings worth of anointing is not something cheap. She gives her best to the Lord. That simply means, you know what David says in 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 24. David says that uh, he will not give to the Lord that which has cost him nothing. And so Mary is aware that connecting with anointing that is in the Lord requires selflessness. It requires you to give your best. You know, it is a giving that makes you feel pain in your heart. It is a giving that makes you feel a little uncomfortable. And to some of us here in this great cathedral, and may the Lord bless you for your standing with ministry in this great cathedral, some of you, God is calling you in this season to be those very special givers for ministry in this cathedral. To give that which makes you feel pain. To give that which makes you wonder, have I really done the right thing? But the Lord knows that you're giving your very best. In all sense, cathedral, for that ministry to stand and for us to put the billion Kenya shillings project that we did, we have men and women who've recognized the blessings that are tapped out of generosity in, in God's work because God then rewards. And so when you connect with God at the place of giving, then the anointing from the Lord then flows into your life and deals with issues that need to be dealt with. And so tonight, probably that is something that you'd want to carry to the Lord. Lord, teach me to be a selfless, generous giver who will give to the cause of your work. Mary did not know actually the impact of what she was doing because the world was going to recognize what she had done. That is what John says. John chapter 12. Um, John chapter 12 says that Jesus commends her 
for what she has done because the entire world will bear witness to what, uh, to what she has done. The entire world will bear witness that what she has done is an incredible thing. And so when you do something incredible for God, whether it's in form of giving yourself materially, whether in terms of giving yourself for service, then the Lord releases that impact to impact generations. God says in that word that what she's done, believers will experience it for the generations to come. It simply means when we give to the Lord, both our resources and our lives, then generations will be impacted by what we have done. Amen? And when people talk about what God is doing in this parish, your name will be told. Your testimony will be shared about what God is doing. And so your love for Christ must be demonstrated in the impact of how you release yourself and your resources in championing the cause of the gospel. Lastly, the anointing here signifies Mary reducing herself to the place of a slave because she undoes her hair. She reduces herself to the place of a slave. You know, kneeling at the feet of somebody was an act undertaken by slaves. So when masters would come, because they'd walk in sandals and their feet will be so dirty, so when they come home, they'll, they'll stand by the door, then the servants who are their slaves, will bring a basin with water and then kneel and then wash. That is what Jesus demonstrates in John chapter 13, which we will do tomorrow. And so, an act of kneeling and wiping somebody's legs was a reserve for, for slaves and for servants. And so she comes down to the place of a servant. But then, the second thing she does, she undoes her hair and then she uses that hair to wipe the feet of Jesus. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 15, the Bible says that the hair is the woman's glory. The hair is her glory. So she strips herself of her glory and chooses to be undignified for the sake of dignifying our Lord Jesus Christ. Mary then chose to be profiled, to be criticized, to be an outcast among the Jewish community by undoing her hair and becoming a slave so that she can serve the Lord. It is out of the love for God that she had. I don't know tonight if there is something that you want to release for the Lord. I don't know whether there's something you've held inside of you that you've never released to him. And tonight, even as you come to the place of prayer, you're saying, I want to surrender this to the feet of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to put this at the foot of Jesus and I want to release this to him. That the anointing that is present in our Lord Jesus Christ then may flow through me because that anointing then breaks the powers and the works of the devil. I don't know what is it that you want to bring to his feet. Maybe some of us, it is the things we've constructed inside of us. Maybe it's your sinfulness that you want to surrender to him and say, Lord, I now surrender this. Some of us, it's a pledge for your resources to serve God's kingdom. Some of us, it's, it's probably the pride and feelings of your achievements that you want to surrender to the Lord, that the Lord may take it, release fresh anointing for you to do his work. As I was preparing this, the Lord reminded me so, so strongly, and it was a rebuke to me. That you know, this thing of thinking that being the provost of All Saints Cathedral is such an achievement. The Lord rebuked me when I was preparing this and told me that I must lay the thinking and the feelings of my achievements at his feet and allow him to reign in my life as Lord and as King because outside of him, I cannot do anything. Probably you are like me. And you are saying tonight, there is something you want to release. There is something you want to release to the Lord and say, King Jesus, this one I've held, I've felt, I've wanted to be so honorable. I've wanted to be a mungwana. But tonight, I want to come to you. 
Maybe you feared giving your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and you felt, no, it's not your time. No, I come from such and such a family saying that I'm saved will bring embarrassment. And, and therefore you've held back and tonight you're saying you want to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. I want us to get to that moment of prayer. I want us to get to that moment of prayer and say, Lord Jesus, I surrender. Lord Jesus, I surrender. Just say, I surrender, Lord Jesus. All to thee I surrender. My resources I surrender. My pride I surrender. My fears I surrender. My unguana and honorableness I surrender. I surrender my resources to you. I surrender my husband, my wife, my children, my singlehood I surrender. Tonight you're saying that Lord Jesus, I come to you with, in total surrender that you may take over. I come to you in total trust that you alone may reign over my life. I just want you to invite you to close your eyes in prayer and ask you that there is something profoundly you are releasing to the Lord tonight. There is something you are releasing to King Jesus tonight. I am releasing mine tonight and there is something you are releasing to him tonight. I'm saying, Jesus, only you be enthroned in my life. Not my education, not the school where I went to. Not the fasts that I've registered in life. The first woman to be this, the first man to be this, the first Minyankole to be this, the first Baganda to be this. Those fasts, Lord, tonight we surrender them. That Jesus, you alone may reign. Just raise up your hand that we may pray with you. Just raise up your hand. You're saying, Pastor, this one I surrender to the Lord Jesus. I don't want to carry this one anymore. It's too heavy. It's too embarrassing. The risks with this is too much. Just raise it up with confidence, knowing that Jesus is king and is reigning over us. Thank you, beloved. Thank you for your hands. Just come up. Just come up. Just come up for prayer. Just get up and come up for prayer. Jesus is ready. As we sing surrender, I surrender all to thee. Just come up. Just come up here for prayer. Even as we, even as we, we sing that song prayerfully. Just come up for prayer. Hallelujah. I surrender.